welcome to the fourth and final installment of Transit Tuesdays. My name is Peter Kirsten. I'm a planner here at the RTA in the Planning and Market Development Group. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this webinar is being recorded and along with the previous three sessions will be available for review on the RTA website. All webinar attendees microphone should be already muted. We ask that you stay muted um, during the next hour. Please use the chat box for any questions you may have. Uh, you can see the chat box highlighted from the toolbar on your screen here. We do plan to save a few minutes at the end um, for questions and answers. This event was originally slated to be an in-person workshop covering all four sessions in a single day. Then COVID-19 took hold in the United States and our region and we moved the event online. <clears throat> Since then, there's been ongoing protests and unrest in cities across the country. By all accounts, the mobility environment is shifting rapidly in some ways that we were seeing previous to COVID-19 and in some ways that we're seeing as a result of COVID-19. As such, we've assembled a panel of experts to talk about this changing mobility environment. First up is Professor Joseph Schwederman, the director of the Chaddock Institute at DePaul University. He'll focus on national trends in mobility providers and modes. Second will be Holly Bieneman, bureau chief from IDOT and Nick Bowden, CEO and co-founder of Replica. Holly and Nick will share about the travel demand model that Replica has created for the state of Illinois, uh, as well as uh, updates Replica has produced to model changes as a result of the COVID virus. Lastly, Molly Poppy, the Chief Innovation Officer at CTA, will provide insights into local changes in the mobility environment and specifically how this is shifting CTA's efforts in connecting with customers. Here's the agenda for today. Um, again, feel free to submit questions via the chat function during each, pre each presentation. My colleague Peter Farenwald will monitor questions um, and then we'll do a combined Q&A uh, at the end. In addition to the presenters we have today, I'll quickly just highlight some of the work the RTA is doing in partnership with CTA, Metra, and PACE to keep the region informed on the transit landscape during the COVID-19 pandemic. The RTA has launched a COVID-19 dashboard showing ridership, service revenue, and sales tax updates. As you can see in this figure, year-over-year -year ridership has dropped dramatically since the stay-at-home order was issued March 21. Additionally, these impacts have been expressed differently across the modes. Metro and CTA rail seeing the biggest declines in riderships, while both bus modes have seen smaller declines. Even with the dramatic year-over-year -year shifts, the RTA system as a whole is still averaging roughly 320,000 trips per weekday uh, since the stay-at-home stay order was issued. <clears throat> These trips are essential workers powering our economy and essential travel for transit-dependent communities, ensuring that people can access resources during this time. This is the full view of the dashboard. Uh, I encourage everyone to go to rtachicago.org to explore the data in more detail. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to our first presenter, uh, Joseph Schwederman. Well, th thank you so much. And uh, what a uh, timely uh, moment to have a webinar like this where trans agencies are facing, uh, you know, not only uh, the changing mobility environment, which has uh, you know, been titanic, and of course COVID. And putting the two together, you really get a, uh, a profound time to have this discussion. And um, what I'm going to do is just walk through some of the uh, uh, research we're doing and how I think you can think about the changing environment. And uh, Peter, are you going to advance the slides or? Uh, yeah, just say yeah. just say next when I should yeah. advance. Next slide. And I'll just start by saying, you know, it was really a, a, a tremendous run for transit from 2004 almost to 2016, where you saw dramatic growth. So when we do hear reports about declines, uh, you, you need to sort of take some of it with a grain of salt that we're coming up all time highs on the rail system, Metro and steady growth. The bus system, uh, particularly city bus system, it's been more problematic. Pace has been uh, reasonably strong, you know, but boy, nationwide, it's uh, it's been a, been a tough time, especially for small agencies. So when you look at the environment, I attribute uh, uh, the, the downturn uh, to many, many factors. And the mobility environment is probably just one and maybe not even the largest factor when you look at work from home and things like that. So what I'd like to do is just give you some perspective on what I think are some of the underlying drivers of this change mobility environment. Uh, next slide, if you would. And I've been transit for, for 30 years. I'm a daily Metro rider. I've just uh, uh, watched this system uh, both as a professional and as a, a just a concerned citizen. And one thing I've been intrigued to watch is just how mobility, we track for many years, how people use devices when they travel, 
we observed people on Metra, uh, Pace buses, Greyhound, and others, and saw that these devices are becoming, um, uh, you know, a way of life in ways that, in many ways, have been great for transit because you bring your device with you, you can use the time on transit productively. Uh, it makes transit uh, environment much more suitable to doing work. Uh, and then another aspect of that, just how people engage with devices for ticketing and so forth. And Ventra had a really tremendous start. I think Ventra is doing, doing quite well overall with some of the changes they make. Uh, but there's newcomers on the scene that are shaking things up a bit. The Transit app, which is a, a nationwide app in which many transit systems uh, are, are giving us finally the ability to bring with you payment options around the country on different transit systems. And I call it fare box anxiety when I travel <laughs> and I want to take the bus and I think, okay, do I really want to study how I have to do this? Do I need to download an app? Do I need to have correct change? Do I need to uh, study a require 10 clicks to, to get a card and that the break uh, breakthroughs are coming with that and it's a long time coming I think so we'll see how venture evolves uber at the same time is making its app much more transit oriented you know you can now search combined uber and transit trips to find the best route to combine modes in Denver you can buy a transit ticket on the uber app but our sense that the uber app was or perhaps the uh, the lift app was going to become an all-purpose mobility uh, platform hasn't happened as quickly as we thought and now we'll see what evolves with the transit app and others uh, making a pretty big push for primacy in, in this space next slide and uh, one thing i'd like to say what well, we did which i think was uh was fascinating is we just asked if you're standing at a street corner and this is one of our data collectors and you want to go from point a to point b what does uber lyft buy you versus transit and we found in our city, mostly transit does pretty well, that the cost you pay to go to and from downtown uh, versus uh, on a ride share versus transit, you, you're paying a lot per minute saved if you're using ride share, even uh, Uber Pool or, or Lyft Line. And, but we found you get out of downtown where you're going between places where transit service you know, isn't so good, it requires bus to bus connections. It can be a real value proposition, in fact, uh, fill holes where the transit trip may be unacceptably long. So we're trying to argue for kind of a nuanced approach for looking at ride sharing. Uh, the city, as you might know, launched uh, a down uh, a new tax system that includes uh, a bigger fee for downtown travel, which we felt, uh, you know, sort of played to the arguments that you don't need to use Uber and Lyft as much in, in the central city environment. So uh, the argument for tax uh, taxing it there is more persuasive than in outlying areas. Uh, right now, the pandemic, uh, the shared ride services have been uh, been annulled. So we have a bit of a, a mobility gap in, in some cases where where you have no choice but the solar ride services. Um, so our region has is, is mostly been viewed as a either or ride share versus transit as two uh, uh, opposing forces, you might say. And we think during the pandemic, well, the next slide, we published some research on this, which tries to make the argument that there are examples where you can partner. And we looked at a detailed look at this. We work with the Shared Use Mobility Center on this at partnerships around the country where they use rideshare to solve certain problems, not to replace transit per se, uh, which we strongly oppose, but to augment it or to fill gaps or to deal with uh, inevitable um, uh, problems of, of coverage that you can't solve. And just to give you a few examples of the kind of things we looked at, uh, next slide, is uh, uh, in a city like uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, uh, they had no choice but to cut some fixed route service where the cost per rider was close to, I think, 40 bucks a passenger. You know, just didn't work with their funding model. The ridership was too low. And they're offering $5 subsidies per trip on ride share to people traveling to those areas. Uh, Boston uh, kept its paratransit system but it's trying to re reduce pressure on that. It's found that we need to get people who don't need a wheelchair accessible vehicle uh, not to use those as frequently. So they're offering a big subsidy on a ride share up to $40 per trip, which is a bit uh, eye-opening how, how generous it is. Uh, but they're doing the math, trying to see if it's uh, cost effective and they're fairly uh, impressed with the results so far. Uh, real limits on who can use it. You have to be a certain age, you have to be a uh, uh, eligible for paratransit service, um, but um, 
uh, they run basically two parallel systems, paratransit and this new uh, on-demand pilot. Detroit, uh, and this is something where I would think Chicago could experiment perhaps, is late night, you know, after 11 p.m., you need to get to a bus stop and uh, uh, there's no connecting bus service. So they work with a private foundation, have a, a lift credit you can use. And, uh, and down at the bottom there in, uh, in uh, Tacoma, there's uh, another program to kind of fill gaps in the transit system with, uh, with a geofenced area, very specialized program. So we just had the study, we had a webinar talking about how we think these programs may be positioned well uh, as transit agencies you know, struggle with some of the lightly used bus routes, uh, particularly late night here on the periphery of town. So next slide. Um, it's somewhat, you know, that's somewhat controversial. We think it can be done with uh, while protecting our trans system. And we're the first to argue that sustaining uh, this existing system and investing in it is, is clearly first, uh, first priority. Uh, but the world's changing and it's time to, you know, think, think outside the box, as we say. So I want to say a few words about uh, scooters. And I think the one thing about those changing mobility environment is how now we have all these different modes that, um, they're on the psyche of people. They want to get from point A to point B. They're emailing their friends. They're texting. They're talking. They're very aware of the options available to them. And uh, uh, the e-scooter pilot in Chicago, I think, reflected that. Where we had uh, uh, quite a few different companies and and young uh, people and all people found ways to overcome the complexity of having you know more than a half dozen providers out there in their neighborhood using the apps and it was a pretty successful pilot we'll see on the west side. Uh, we're waiting to see what happens this summer. Uh, but most of the, the, unfortunately, most of the attention to scooters has gone to, you know, and, and this these issues all deserve credit, don't get me wrong. Uh, how safe are they? Are they cluttering the sidewalks? Are they uh, um, uh, computers company complying with all the ordinance uh, requirements, which were pretty strict? And, and those discussions need to be had, but there's been relatively little research on just what kind of mobility they provide. What does it do to fill a gap in somebody's life? And then and we conducted some research by using uh, API data where the scooters are available. You can go on to the next slide. And we tried to ask, what does it buy you to have these scooters in your neighborhood? And we found that on long trips, it doesn't buy you very much. If you're gonna go four miles, you can walk to the bus stop, transfer, get to the get to your, your subway line, get to where you want to go. It may save you a minute or two. Uh, but if you're going and if you're going less than a half mile, it's probably not worth it either because you're going to pay a fee, probably upwards of 250 to use a scooter to save you four minutes. That's not a good value proposition. But if you're in that sweet spot of about a half mile to maybe one mile and a half, it fills a gap that we found pretty compelling. Uh, Divi bikes, especially uh, in the pods, aren't particularly attractive there because you have, often have to walk a few blocks out of the way to get your bike and then drop it off at another pod. And that'll have a few minutes walk on that end. And so you can't go straight from point A to point B. The Divi bike is tremendous on trips over say a mile, mile and a half. But uh, on shorter trips, you know, the economics work in some cases, some cases they don't. So we looked at the uh, distribution of e-scooters and we ran simulations of people go between random points between the neighborhoods. And uh, on what share of the trips uh, did it save you time? And we looked at all distances within the what zone, this on the west side of Chicago. And we found that, you know, in upwards of a third of the trips, sometimes more, it had an appreciable savings in time. Whether it was worth paying the $3 for the scooter we had some results, some cases it wasn't, but on a lot of trips, it really did fill a gap. So as we try to promote car-free living and transit lifestyles, we think there's a place for scooters. You know, do we think they should be downtown on lakefront? Yeah, probably not, uh, but we certainly don't think a hyper-cautious approach uh, is, is called for given this mobility gap that needs to be filled. And so as we look at these modes, I think it's important to, again, stress that they serve a mobility niche, and it's uh, it's not just um, uh, purely competition between one mode and another. There are some uh, there are some some benefits to this. So, of course, now it uh, looks like the summer e-scooter pilot may or may not happen because of COVID. Probably not. 
but certainly the next phase of this and of course the suburbs and downstate, we're gonna see some uh, activity perhaps next year as well. Uh, next slide, Peter, and we're just about done here. Uh, so just in closing, what, what I'm recommending is just experiment. And I was on uh, the mayor's task force on new mobility options that are Mayor Manuel. And Molly, I know, was on that as well, was on the program today. And we really push for an environment of experimentation where we try stuff and it doesn't work. We, we move to the next thing, but we recognize that we can't just look around the country and, and play copycat. You know, we have to try our own things. So uh, I just had a Cranes op-ed this week that talks about, for example, how Metra uh, can continue to experiment. There's really some great work happening there with express trains. Pace, of course, has got a number of new services. And uh, CTA, no doubt, is going to be trying new things, too. Uh, and that's, I think, what it's going to take in this COVID environment is just to keep trying and probably tearing down perhaps some of the barriers between these different modes and see if there's a way to build a little synergy so people living life without a personal car, you know, can access all these options and see them fit together in some, uh, you know, some, some efficient way. So I think that's it, Peter. We can go to my last slide on questions, and uh, we can do questions now if anybody has any. But I just thanks for the opportunity to to chime in on a really uh, topic that's like dear to all our hearts: uh, what comes next for uh, for mobility. Great, thank you, uh, Professor Schwederman. Um, and we are going to do we're going to save and do a combined Q and A at the end. Um, so feel free to submit those questions uh, via the chat box. We'll, we'll collect those. Um, and direct those to the presenters accordingly um, at the end of our segment here. Um, up next is uh, Holly uh, from IDOT and Nick from Replica. Uh, are you guys both on the line and available? Ready to go? Yes, hello there. Yep, hello. All right, take it away. Hi, so this is Holly Beanman with IDOT. I'm the Bureau Chief of Planning. I uh, just wanted to give a brief overview of our relationship with Replica. Um, and of course, I would be remiss to not mention uh, if you could go to the next slide. Next slide. Um, some fun facts about Illinois. We have 12.74 million residents. That's 9.19 million licensed drivers. Uh, 147,000 centerline miles, 58 transit systems with 621 million transit passenger trips. One of my favorite facts is that we have in Illinois nearly 7,000 local governments. Uh, Texas is the next with 5,147 and 16 million more people. So as I'm sure you all are familiar with, there's a lot of coordinating going on when it comes to uh, data um, as, uh, as well as transportation. If you would move to the next slide, please. Um, so, you know, COVID-19 happened. I think we all adjusted as we could. And I, you know, one thing that was happening at IDOT a lot was the, um, the people were asking us for data. We had people coming from every corner of the state um, asking us, what are you seeing for, you know, vehicle counts? What, how's transit ridership doing? What is happening um, to our system with people working from home and there being less, uh, less people moving? Um, and initially we, we struggle with this because IDOT's data is delayed in that like our revenue numbers, so whatever we collect from the motor fuel tax, uh, that is one to three months delayed because uh, it goes, it is collected by the Illinois Department of Revenue and then comes to IDOT. Um, so we're not, you know, we haven't seen what the impact is on our revenue yet. Um, our traffic counts. We have spot locations where we conduct traffic counts, but that's not representative of the whole system. And even that is delayed by a week. Um, and so, you know, we were running into problems with that. Then we're also hearing from the governor's office, um, you know, how are people moving? We, we want to know how people are moving during this time. We want to see where they're going so we can understand, uh, you know, if we have to make some policy decisions based on um, based on how people are moving. Um, and so we have the existing tool, which I hope you all know about of Replica, um, which is an excellent tool that shows um, multimodal um, trips and and then trip um, trip um, 
uh, needs as well. So why the trip is occurring, uh, why the trip is occurring, how it is occurring. Um, and we reached out to Replica because we thought, well, they provide this great tool for us. I wonder if they're doing anything COVID related. Um, and, you know, at first we, we reached out to Nick and he was like, no, we're not. And we're, OK, that's fine. But and I'm sure he'll get into a little more detail about this. But, um, you know, he said New York has reached out to us and he came back and said New York's reaching out to us. We 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 are working on something. And so we moved forward. We checked with um, the governor's office, IEMA, um, state agencies that were also working on the COVID response um, to make sure that the information would be useful for them, which, of course, they did find. Um, and so we worked with Replica to move forward on the COVID-19 data, um, which I will turn it over to Nick and uh to to give an overview of that okay thank you holly if Thanks. you want to go to the next slide peter so i'll provide a little bit of uh, holly gave a little bit of background but we uh pre-covid um build kind of activity-based travel models at the core and we use a combination of uh location data uh built environment data uh transaction data um, and then data that comes from the agencies so think city of chicago cta mta and we work with agencies kind of across the country and that's a pretty that's a heavier set process because we do things like trip mode and trip purpose and household attributes but uh, as holly mentioned uh when when COVID hit uh and the typical kind of heuristics for monitoring movements uh would no longer existed um, we slim down some of how we produce a normal rep to produce uh, what in effect is a daily updated set of origin destination pairs. So we provide yesterday's data kind of late in the afternoon today is one way to think about that. Uh, and we started kind of at February 1st to get a baseline and then it gets updated every day. So what you're looking at on the screen uh, is I just filtered down the top left just to the month of February. Uh, so if you look across the state, this is resident movements in February, you know, give or take, I think the low end might be 34, 35 million, the high end might be 42 million, but average about 37 million movements to be all movements. So this would be everything from you know, home and work commutes to uh, shopping, to eating, to going to school. Um, the third little graph at the top there is the time distribution graph. So that's a pretty normal looking uh, bar chart for time distribution. You have an AM kind of peak uh, and then a PM peak, uh, and then obviously you can see from the data you've got movements kind of all over the state, although Chicago region obviously has the highest density of movement. So that's that's a bit of a snapshot. I think everybody, of course, knows that movements are down, but um, if this is the pre-COVID, we can go to the next slide, Peter. Uh, this is the during kind of shelter in place. So I've got now April uh, is kind of the date selected. So you see movements in the state are down to 22 million. It's averaged across all of those days. So I think on the low end of this, you've got uh, all the way down to like maybe 16 or 17 million movements in the state, which is you know, more than a 50% drop in all movements. Uh, but, you know, 40-ish, that's pretty typical of what we're seeing. We have access to the whole country. So we're looking at kind of daily national movements. And that's in metro air, in, in urban areas, it's probably been a little bit more. Uh, so upwards of 50 to 60%, a drop from kind of the total or regular kind of pre-COVID to, to during shelter in place. And then notably uh, in that same kind of hourly distribution graph, you see effectively the elimination of, of the kind of the, the big peaks. You still have a bit of an afternoon build, but by and large, there's no more AM peak because you've got obviously folks working from home uh, and school's canceled. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is a line graph of, of total movements for the state of Illinois. Uh, it's by day, starting February 1st through uh, last week, uh, Friday of last week, June 2nd. So I think the spikiness that you see, uh, if you move from left to right, uh, that's pretty typical of kind of weekday, weekend behavior. And then it's a little bit hard to see on the axis, but where the, the, the drop really starts to happen in almost every place was about the second week of March. So in most places, that was the week before kind of formal shelter in places went into place. So um, that first kind of layer of drop, uh, I think what we've seen largely or probably can assume from our data is those are folks that could choose to work from home. So they had a choice and being able to work from home, even though it wasn't at that point required. And then the big drop happens when kind of the formal shelter in places go into effect. And there's still a bit of a weekday weekend kind of peak uh, that occurs. And um, 
I should have put a trend line on here, but but what's interesting, and I think for lots of reasons and the work we're doing, is that movements have increased, particularly uh, over the last 30 days. So uh, in most places, movements are up you know, between 15 and 25% from the bottom, um, even though in a lot of places, shelter in places have not been lifted. And I think what's interesting about that question is that may imply that people moving again is more of a behavioral question uh, than it is a systems or operation question, meaning people are moving as they become comfortable and feel safe moving uh, as much as it is they're, you know, quote unquote, allowed to be moving again. And so uh, the state of Illinois is uh, this trend line, um, again, if you, if you start kind of at the very bottom and move to last week, uh, it's slightly up. And obviously you see uh, there's some new peaks forming uh, they're getting a little bit closer. I think uh, when we've done some of the forecasting work, uh, a lot of the assumptions are at least that as the world gets to some form of a new normal, um, assuming that we don't have obviously a second wave that closes things down again, that that second week of March when choice movers were staying home uh, may represent where everything kind of goes back to. Let's go to the next slide. A few just interesting notes before we end. Um, this is a movement by income. So this is uh, it's actually for, for uh, the state of New York, but it, it applies to the state of Illinois. We just didn't have a graph for it, but uh, a couple of things worth pointing out. So the purple line at the top uh, are movements made by households that have uh, an income exceeding $125,000. The very uh, the blue line at the very bottom is households that, that make less than 10K a year. What's notable about this is that uh, movement patterns for high income households, trip rates dropped about 30 to 35 percent uh, on an average day. So you had uh, a pretty big steep drop in movements and everybody dropped in movements, but the very lowest income groups. So those households making less than 40 K a year, their trip rates only dropped by about 15 percent. So actually dropped by half of the highest income rate. And trip rates for low income groups are, are actually going up faster presumably because they may not have the choice to work from home uh, or have to continue to move. And so there is a disparity, a pretty clear disparity uh, that's occurring. And I think will be a, a longer kind of profound question, which is uh, some of the inequity of, around being able to move or not move or being able to work from home or not work from home feels like it will both have mobility impacts, but also impacts on uh, employment or access to, to goods and services. And the final slide, just as a, an aside here, if we go to the next slide, uh, interesting enough, too, is, is movements by car ownership. So uh, you had the largest drop in movements by those folks that do not own a vehicle. Uh, again, not terribly surprising, but it's a much, much steeper drop than, say, households that have two or three cars. And as you can see, the blue line is uh, no vehicle households. Uh, the orange line is one vehicle households. And then you've got two and kind of three at the bottom. And the, the biggest drops come from those households that have either no vehicle or one vehicle. And in, in part two, as we look out or start to track this, this graph ends at uh, the end of April, uh, movements as people are starting to move again, households that own vehicles, even if it's just one, are starting to move faster uh, uh, than households that don't own a vehicle. And then the last thing that I don't have a slide for, but just again, a note is that one of the things we're also seeing finally uh, is that total movements, so across all modes are increasing faster than transit movements. Uh, so while transit movements are up from the bottom, as you saw on that kind of initial graph, uh, the percentage change in movements of, of kind of all modes is slightly increasing um, or is increasing a, a bit faster than, than those folks getting back onto transit. So I think one thing to monitor that we're looking at closely is, uh, does that uh, kind of go back to normal where transit is capturing the same share that they were before COVID? Uh, and if not, what's the delta between the two? So. We'll stop there, uh, and then I know that we have. If, if folks have questions, we can take those at the end. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, again, yes, go ahead and submit those questions via the chat box, but we will save uh, save them for the end and do a combined Q and A with all three presenters. Um, so, last presenter up is uh, Molly Puppy, the Chief Innovation Officer with the Chicago Transit Authority. And uh, Molly, are you on the line? You can take it away. Yep, yeah, I'm here. Uh, so thanks so much for, for having me and you know, just to, to sort of, I guess this is a good ending to the prior two presenters to talk about what this looks like for CTA and how CTA is thinking about 
uh, the mobility environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, so I don't have any slides. I'm just going to sort of talk through some of this and, and happy to answer questions at the end. I'll save I'll save a good amount of time for questions because I think there's a fair amount of questions coming in uh, from from folks on the call. So something to think about is is just COVID-19 really does appear to be accelerating many of the challenging trends that transit agencies were already facing uh, sort of pre-COVID. You know, transit agencies, as Professor Schwedeman uh, mentioned, we were seeing declines in ridership, whether that was due to uh, growth in rideshare usage, whether that was also a growth in, in more people working from home and having more flexible scheduling. Uh, there was concerns around cleanliness and safety on public transit. Uh, those are obviously all uh, sort of remain in our, our significant headwinds that transit is facing now that COVID-19 uh, you know, is with us. But further, as we start to, to see this new normal and the reopening, what does COVID-19 do to traffic congestion? What does it do to the actual use of personal car ownership? And how does that not only impact ridership, but how does that also impact the reliability of public transit? And so I think as we, we sort of come out of this uh, COVID-19 world into, into what travel patterns will look like, it really does present a unique opportunity for transit agencies to really double down on what we know works for our riders, but also really re-examining the services and operations that we currently have and make sure that we really revamp and retool them to, to meet the needs of, of riders today. It really goes to what Professor Schwederman was talking about as it relates to experimentation. Transit agencies really need to think about uh, smart and strategic experimentation, but also not always sort of abandon, and I don't think that's what the professor is saying, but also not abandon what, what works. Um, it, so just a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on CTA and, and how we're, we're thinking about it. Um, obviously, there are significant financial challenges that the agencies are facing that we continue to, to work through. And obviously, the CARES Act did provide uh, a sort of lifeline, if you will, to transit agencies, but it's not going to be a, a long-term or self-sustaining uh, lifeline. We are going to need to return fare box revenue. We are going to need to think about what are the impacts of other revenues that we receive from the state uh, or fed, federal government as we as we move forward. Uh, as as RTA mentioned, we did see a precipitous decline in ridership. It was not equal across the system. Uh, we are saw about a 78% decline in bus ridership and about an 86% decline in rail ridership. But we still continue to see a fair amount of ridership on south and west side, primarily on the southwest side of Chicago on our bus routes. Uh, and so we have had to, to really adjust to try to continue to serve those customers, those essential uh, workers, while also uh, battling with uh, you know, lower, lower ridership in certain areas and also uh, issues around attendance. What we see more than anything is that there really isn't as much of an AM and PM peak anymore. We do see a little peaking in AM and PM, but for the most part, we're actually seeing ridership uh, relatively low in the morning, and you actually see it rising throughout midday and then uh, dropping off towards, towards the evening hours. Uh, what we also know from our riders during COVID-19, uh, from a recent ridership survey that we did, it was roughly 30% of our riders during the governor's stay-at-home order were healthcare workers. Uh, another 15% uh, said that they were grocery store workers or in the food supply. And then another 6% uh, were caretakers. So I think it just really doubles down on the importance of public transit and how public transit really did support uh, the city and state's response to COVID-19 and how it's gonna be important that we are able to continue to deliver quality service in the uh, in the new normal and as we begin to reopen and our economy starts starts to recover. So some of the ways that we were really approaching uh, COVID-19 and thinking about COVID-19 is you know, the idea of having uh, packed blue line bus, blue line trains, you know, everyone boarding at Damon and uh, packing in like sardines uh, is probably not going to return to CTA uh, in the near future or, or potentially at all. Uh, so we are really need to, needing to think about how do we keep public transit relevant when our entire service model is sort of flipped on its head where we're not necessarily mass transit anymore and we're almost discouraging, uh, discouraging ridership. 
so one of the ways we've been thinking about that is, is how do you promote choice for your riders and how do we promote choice for CTA riders? Uh, a lot of the, the conversations that we've been having internally is the idea of having a rideshare partnership around first last mile maybe doesn't make sense anymore. That was a lot of the partnerships that previously existed between transit agencies and rideshare companies. And now it's really thinking about you know, where do we need to provide flexibility to riders where you know, due to social distancing or frequency or, or other issues, CTA may not be the best option for our customers. So how do we continue to remain uh, an option for individuals, but also encourage them to have choice? Uh, this also sort of spreads to micro mobilities as well around scooters and bikes uh, and an interesting uh, or relatively exciting advantage that CTA has is we already started to work on a partnership with Divi Lyft uh, prior to COVID-19 and we will actually be rolling out a brand new uh, venture app with Pace and Metra but will, it will also have uh, Divi bikes integrated into that app. So uh, CTA riders and public transit riders not only will see the options available to them from our regional partners, but they will also be able to see the transit, uh, the transportation options available to them by Divi. Uh, and so we're really trying to encourage that choice, but encourage that choice within the CTA uh, and within the public transit model. Uh, some of the other things that we're, we're approaching and thinking about is the idea of more flexibility for our customers around fair products and pass products. Uh, you know, we all sort of looked at, you want a monthly pass, you want as many customers in a monthly pass as possible. That was sort of the pre-COVID uh, thought around fair products. Now we know that in this post-COVID world, individuals are not gonna be coming into work every day. They're not gonna be coming into work Monday through Friday. They may be coming into work one week and off another week and working from home. So how do we create a fair product and a pass product that really encourages those individuals to continue to ride transit and see transit as a viable option for them? Because for many individuals, if you're not coming in every day of the week, you know, maybe that $8, $10 Uber ride makes sense to you because you know you're not going to have to pay. Uh, you're not coming in every day. You're not doing this on a daily basis. So it's really thinking about how do we create that flexibility? And I go back to how do we continue to, to encourage choice and make choice available to our riders, but without sort of diluting CTA. Um, and some of the other things that we continue to think about is, is really customer focused technology investments. Uh, you hear a lot, uh, and as Replica mentioned, there's a lot of interest around data. And it's not just data from policymakers, it's data from customers. Customers and, and everyday riders really want to understand how full is that bus that might be coming to me? Where is the bus? How long do I have to wait? All of those things that we, we really heard pre-COVID, but have become even more important in the post-COVID world. So CTA continues to, to work and think through ways that we can leverage the great technology partnerships that exist throughout uh, the city and how can we leverage that, that expertise to create uh, technologies that our riders want. Uh, so it, it's, it's creating a fullness tool where individuals can see real time what a bus or train uh, capacity looks like so that the customer can make the choice if they wanna ride that 56 bus that's two minutes away or if they wanna ride the, the number 56 Milwaukee bus that's maybe six minutes away because they see it's only a fourth of the way full. Now, all of this takes time to implement and it's not something we can all snap our fingers on, but it's important that we start having these conversations now and continue to iterate on these type of investments so that our customers know we're working, so that our customers don't sort of see public transit as the dinosaur uh, that's not evolving with, with this new normal, that we're really uh, trying to meet this new normal in a way that is, is uh, sort of counter sometimes to how public transit tends to think. And, and just really the last piece, which doubling down on, on what works is, is bus lanes. You know, we have had conversations with the Department of Transportation and we'll continue to have those conversations around uh, dedicated bus lanes and emergency bus lanes. I think we all can start to see a world, uh, or at least I hope we don't have a world where it's Carmageddon and everyone is riding their personal vehicle to work and their personal vehicle to get around. Um, and so what we're really talking with Department of Transportation about is are there emergency bus lanes that we can start to create 
throughout our bus network that will increase the speed and reliability of our bus and also ensure our buses don't get uh, sort of bogged down and locked up in the uh, in the cars that are we know are going to be coming. And just the, the last piece I want to leave want to leave with from a CTA and from a partnership perspective, as we think about partnering with new mobility methods, especially ride share and some of these other uh, you know, new services that are out there, it's important for CTA to also think about what is our primary service model. As we have existed for the last hundred some odd years, uh, we delivered folks to downtown. We were a loop centric model. And that's how our buses, that's how our trains are built. That's how our bus routes are typically built is they run to and through downtown, especially our, our sort of AM and PM piece. Now, if individuals continue to work from home and that starts to become the new normal, you know, it's going to be really hard for us to adjust our trains. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to move some of our train routes uh, from where they serve us now. But how can we be more agile with our bus routes? And then how can we think about uh, partnering with some of these rideshare companies and other companies out there. It doesn't necessarily need to be rideshare. It can be with bikes. It can be scooters. Uh, how do we think about those partnerships to meet this more neighborhood to neighborhood community based travel that we anticipate will start to become more of the new normal versus the everyone comes to downtown between the hours of seven and nine and leaves between the hours of four and six. And that's really going to be, be a strong shift that all these transit agencies, especially CTA, uh, is going to need to address and think through how do we uh, create the most efficient and effective model to support how riders want to ride now. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, I, th I think it's question time now, but I don't, don't want to jump ahead of you, Peter. Uh, you are correct. Thank you very much, Molly. <clears throat> and uh, with that, I will actually turn it over to my colleague Peter Farenwald, who has been hanging out in the chat and uh, will start fielding some questions for us. OK, thanks, Peter. Um, got a question, I guess, for, maybe for Molly, um, kind of uh, maybe a, a slightly benefit of this whole situation is with the, with some of the uh, reduced ridership, there's potential to get in and do some maintenance. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and if if uh, you see a, a change in maintenance practices or may, or even maintenance needs is, is the service has to readjust. Yeah, so what's interesting um, is even with the reduced ridership, uh, but with the six feet social distancing, you actually can't run uh, too much less service because uh, you do need to provide the, the space for people uh, to feel safe. So from a maintenance perspective, we and from a CTA perspective, we have not cut, we didn't reduce service uh, during the, the stay at home order and in response to COVID, we continue to run our normal service, which has allowed us to really the social distancing and limit the the system, uh, which we're sort of delivering rides. I think we're delivering about 300,000 rides per day. Uh, so we haven't actually seen an increase in, in maintenance work or an ability to do more maintenance. And that is really because we are still delivering uh, more riders than, than some transit agencies delivered pre-COVID. And we are running social service to try to continue to improve that social distancing that unfortunately uh, I think we would have liked to have done more maintenance and able to take advantage of that, but, but we don't that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and maybe for, for Joe and maybe if Molly, if, if you had, had something to add to um, a little bit more about uh, uh, service on demand concepts that, that have been uh, been piloted elsewhere for, for low uh, ridership areas. Um, is that something that, that seems to be a, a strategy that could help the response to the COVID situation and maybe that, maybe that would be accelerated, that kind of movement would be accelerated by the response needs. And then, and then also a little, a little bit about uh, electric and automated vehicles. Is that automated vehicles, is that uh, something to consider in the, in the horizon that we can think about or is that still far, far off? Yeah, I'll take a whack at that. See, uh, that part of that question came from Jerry Kwan. So good to have a Blue Demon on the line here today, <laughs> uh, fellow Blue Demon. 
Uh, but that's really a, a timely discussion. And I think uh, one thing we found in our research is that via, in particular, via transportation, you know, sells to certain transit agencies its software as a service uh, options where you can um, not only use your paratransit vehicles to be powered by VIA, which uses dynamic routing, you know, but some systems are actually branding uh, large van service, many so forth, dynamically using that kind of software. And uh, so you think of like the pay system where a lot of the buses are contracted out privately already, you can envision uh, a future where there could be smaller vehicles that are dy dynamically routed and, uh, you know, so they meet certain service metrics, you know, number of people on the vehicle on average, every cost per ride. We're seeing this happen in, in Jersey City, which after years of frustration with New Jersey Transit, uh, created almost a parallel transit system using VIA vans, where um, vehicles uh, operated by VIA rove the streets, the $2 a ride can take you anywhere in, in Jersey City. Um, and it's designed to complement transit and fill holes in the system. So I think we'll see more of that. Uh, of course, it's hard to do that with, with large scale buses. I mean, even taking it a block to an on-demand drop off could be workable pretty quick. So it probably requires a uh, bit thinking of the model. And I'll let others say a little bit more on autonomous. Most people do think when autonomous vehicles happen, uh, they will primarily start with shared ride services. And, uh, you know, typically intermediate size vans and small buses and things like that. So the future isn't that far off when we talk about uh, carefully managed, and you're the expert on this, uh, Jerry, you could certainly comment, but uh, a number of cities are using autonomous transit vehicles already on sort of semi-defined uh, routes. Uh, and that clearly is, is going to happen before we see full-scale private ownership of autonomous vehicles, which is a future that's uh, uh, has, has dramatic implications beyond today's uh, beyond today's webinar. Okay, good. Um, and there was discussion about uh, particularly Nick and uh, is showing pretty graphically the the, the impact of income uh, distribution on ridership in this current state, and and that the. Uh, uh, Response seems the, re the response as we reopen, we're seeing that uh, car owners, car riders, car use is going up, uh, but that the uh, the lower incomes uh, trip is going going up faster. Um, any thoughts on um, how, how those um, communities that have been historically been excluded? Um, what kind of what kind of new services and data availability can help uh, understand and how and and solve that? problem. Um, maybe Nick could start off with a little bit more of what he's been seeing. Yeah, I think uh, well, I, mentioned, I mentioned this, but I think it, it feels like uh, there's been an acceleration of a lot of trends that I think accessibility and equitability are probably in that bucket. Um, so I don't know that it's it's fundamentally changed uh, from an, uh, an equitability standpoint that that not everybody has an equal access, whether it be through mobility or otherwise, to employment, healthcare, and, and education. And when you go to a shelter in place, right, um, there's a, obviously a group of folks that have the choice, right, and can continue to do what they do, whether that be work or school or healthcare, and, and folks that don't have the same kind of choice set. Um, it does seem like, um, you know the the equation of how you achieve equitability is is both a land use component but it's a mobility point i think you know, joe talked about this too the flexibility of our systems um the adaptive of our systems to not be um you know quite as as not adaptable as they have historically been whether that be transit services and or transit plus micro mobility or some combination of thereof to prevent uh, everybody getting in private autos or everybody getting in Ubers and Lyfts, I think feels like a critical component to actually getting to some form of kind of equitable access moving forward. And and we're at particularly a low point, but there certainly seems like lots of opportunities to use data, whether it be survey data uh, or empirical data, kind of quantitative data to try to drive new policies and decisions around infrastructure. 
Now, what, what, wondering if, if um, Molly and CT maybe has some thoughts on. Uh, you mentioned the new venture app and some of its uh, capabilities in terms of being able to use data more effectively for the help the equity. Yeah. So I think it's important to think about it. it's going to be a struggle that transit agencies start to, to face as real continues. It's going to be that push pull between attracting those choice riders, which we know are painful fares. They're the 30 day pass holders. They're the ones that tend to have more income and, and are really helping to uh, pay more of the transit fare versus uh, Equitable, equitable component of those individuals that may be low income, they may not be on free or reduced rides. And those are the ones that are, are more transit dependent. I think it's going to be important for those transit agencies to find that middle ground of make sure that we continue to provide the equitable service and the choice for those transit reliance uh, customers and also not sort of pivot and only focus on what are the products and what are the technologies that I can do to get that choice rider who may only be going downtown now twice a week uh, to get them back to the system. I think that's going to be an important conversation that transit agencies are going to have to have. Uh, and I think the Venture app really lends itself to, to starting that conversation and pushing to have a more equitable uh, technology product that both benefits choice riders and our uh, sort of transit reliance or, or sort of more regular riders. Uh, the Venture app really pulls in all the different data sources from Metro Pace and Divi and gives those customers the choice. And it also provides other information where you don't have to be going to the website or going to multiple different places um, to, get, to get that information. And so as we continue to evolve in this new normal, it's gonna be important that we really release uh, technology products and, and products in general that all of our riders and is not just sort of pigeonholed and focused on attracting one uh, one type of writer, and that's where the data that Nick has and, and Professor Sweetman have, and others of you know, this customer segmentation and understanding all the different customers that we had and currently have, and what is really driving them to make uh, certain mobility choices. Thanks, I mean, Joe. Too, uh, is a, it is an important issue. Uh, you could any thoughts in terms of the research that you've done in terms of the different kinds of models that are emerging and um, ones that maybe yeah. should gain more interest? Yeah, well, that the the whole transit desert thing is fascinating because you have you know automobile use is close to 100 uh, percent in a lot of those areas, so you just don't have uh, the same risk of cannibalizing transit if you start experimenting. And um, I think. Um, uh, I know another question, uh, jump ahead, related to, you know, the plan to uh, have uh, e-boost or, or pedal assist Divi bikes, lift bikes, excuse me, uh, branded to the uh, uh, Divi system. And that's an example of sort of a partial step that's going to help. You have areas where you're a mile from a transit stop, and at least in conditions of good weather, you know, the Divi is going to be an option. Uh, we also see... Uh, 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 targeted programs for the areas. And what's really exciting about technology now is the way to geofence in ways you couldn't envision. So you can develop a program for any kind of mode, you know, Uber, Lyft, bike sharing, sharing, and have it only apply to a very carefully defined area. And that's what we're seeing around the country. And those areas can, you know, be changed as, as the learning curve moves up. And so uh, we have a set of new tools at our disposal, but uh, I think we all know that you know, running full-size buses uh, post-pandemic is going to be a tough, uh, a tough sell. Okay, um, there was a couple of uh, points made uh, regarding uh, regarding that, the, the, as Molly said, the whole the whole service model is flipped on its head, and, and the the focus on the peak on the peak direction in the in the essential business areas is going to be very different. Um, uh, Joey had mentioned about uh, the TNC uh, congestion fee that was placed placed in, in to try to encourage people to use transit. Um, is that kind of what's the the impact on the whole congestion pricing concept? Is it is it now more of a uh, trying to flatten the peak concept, or uh, is, that, is that a tool that's just not going to be appropriate? Maybe maybe Joe. Start off. Uh, yeah, that's a million dollar one worth a whole webinar in its own right, I think. But uh, 
I think a couple of things. One, um, two converging forces. One, and I'm more optimistic about central cities than most, but I, I fully concede if, if people work at home 10% more than they have in the past, it's going to take away some of the vitality of our central business district with the decline in office market uh, uh, right off the bat. So we do know that uh, growth in downtown traffic uh, may ebb because of employment, but we have super low fuel prices right now. And if there is a version to transit that's going to push people on the road, there's been some pretty scary scenarios, how bad transit congestion could be post-pandemic. So it's not immediately clear if uh, the congestion pricing debate is going to be derailed. Um, I would say, though, that sort of the urgency of it has been taken away for uh, at least the next year or so. Um, and uh, what many of us are calling for is a, uh, a really dynamic system where, um, you know, perhaps the, the fees are very modest, but with electronic uh, license plate readers and others, you know, you can adopt a fee without uh, a massive program that's going to generate pushback from the whole downtown community. Uh, and I've been also saying that some of our worst congestion is on the expressways. And we know that may fix itself eventually, too, if the federal government starts to allow tolling on interstate highways. So all that could uh, accelerate, you know, post-pandemic. And maybe Holly and Nick, uh, from an IDOT's perspective, uh, does, does the tool provide some maybe insights into uh, uh, how it, and, and be able to manage how people begin to come back? Uh, we're already seeing an increase, a faster increase in in auto trips than transit trips. Um, I think at some point, uh, those tr auto trips begin to you know begin to create congestion that maybe didn't in locations that didn't happen before um any thoughts on what idot's tools and and uh, uh policies may be yeah this is holly um you know it's, we're definitely anticipating congestion because of mode shift with people wanting to drive their cars more um, we're evaluating it and keeping an eye on it, but I think it's going to be a, a localized solution. Um, you know, I think we're going to have a lot more problems up in northeastern Illinois um, and then working with our District 1 and the local jurisdictions there to, to do what we can to minimize the impacts on congestion. You know, if anything, I think it's going to demonstrate how important transit is to operating the transportation system. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amali, do you have any thoughts? More thoughts? You've already talked quite a bit about it. No, I think I think I've talked about this topic a lot. But uh, just to correct Professor Sweeterman, it's like the multi-million-dollar question of whether uh, congestion <laughs> pricing works is probably going to have a significant implication on the city budget uh, as well as as transportation. Indeed. And we had a, a question about carpooling. Uh, uh, is that it's that kind of actually that was interesting that over the last uh, several years carpooling at least in our region has been declining uh, with with a part, perhaps because of people not working every day at work anymore um, is carpooling a, a different ways to do it that may may make it more effective maybe Joe well yeah I think the city's uh, new uh, rideshare TNC tax incentivized shared you know, pooling which was a real signal that that's one way out of this congestion mess is just to get more people in the average car. So it's not 1.1 or whatever the total is. I do think our region uh, has kind of fallen behind on this. You look at our, you know, some magnificent tollway system and we don't have a lot of belt in incentives for high occupancy vehicles, even though the infrastructure is almost set up to do that well. Uh, when we redesign highways, we haven't been quick to use high occupancy lanes. Uh, you can envision even the uh, Kennedy Expressway. And I don't know if any of these are ready, of course, for implementation. They're really tough questions. But um, those kind of incentives are a lot less controversial than start charging people per mile travel and other things that are floating around, which, you know, are going to be politically very, very difficult. So uh, I think even taking baby steps in that direction with some, uh, with some experimentation is, is long overdue. Well, great. Well, that brings us up pretty close to one o'clock. Um, so we'll, we'll end it here. Thanks for a great uh, discussion from our, from uh, both the uh, 
participants and the audience. Um, again, the, the webinar will be, the recording will be available on the RTA uh, website uh, shortly, uh, along with recordings of our other three webinars uh, that could, that uh, preceded this one. And we're concluding now our four part webinar series. It's been, uh, I think, a pretty good successful and we'll hope maybe to do, do more in the future. But um, thanks again for everybody's participation. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bye bye.